Hymn 607 in the BB book. Hymn 607 in the BB book. Had I the tongue of Greeks and Jews and nobler speech than angels use. If love be absent, I am found like tinkling brass, an empty sound. Were I inspired to preach and tell all that is done in heaven and hell, or could my faith the world remove, still I am nothing without love. Should I distribute all my store to feed the bowels of the poor, or give my body to the flame to gain the martyr's glorious name. If love to God and love to men be absent, all my hopes are vain. Nor tongues, nor gifts, nor fiery zeal, the works of love can e'er fulfill.
We'll begin our service singing Psalm 110. Father, we pray that thou would make us truly thankful 
for all that thou hast given us. Cause us to look beyond the things of this natural world, the things of time and sense, and let us meditate on the eternal realities where thou dost dwell. We thank thee that thou hast given us place to meet. We thank thee that thou hast given us hearts to meet together. We pray that thou would be our shield, our guide, our strength, and our stay, and more than that, our Savior. Now open thy word to our hearts. Fill our mouths with the sweetness that comes only from thee. May we be able, by the eye of faith, to see Jesus and hear his sweet voice saying, Come unto me. For all this we thank thee. In his name. Amen. going to read a couple of verses this morning from the first epistle of John. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, behold, when you see that word in the scripture, it means pay attention. Behold, John the Baptist said, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And here John, the apostle says, behold. Look at this and look at it carefully. Consider it. Well, what's he telling us to consider? What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Behold the type of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Yes, the love of God is special. The love of God is like nothing else that has ever been, ever shall be, or ever will be. Because God himself is love. Scripture tells us that plainly, doesn't it? God is love. God is light. And as he is love... He has bestowed his love on us. Who's he writing to here? His little children. How many times in this epistle does John use the term my little children or little children? Bunches. 
he's looking at the ones to whom he's writing, not as just people out there, like you and me, people that he'd never known. You know, I have to wonder, Paul, John, James, Luke, when they wrote their epistles and when they wrote their gospels, I wonder if they considered that they would last down through the centuries as they have. And that, though, that people whom they had no idea who they were, people who they couldn't conceive of the times in which they're living, would be reading their words as words inspired or as the literal Greek uh, rendering would be, God breathed. We believe them to be God breathed through these people. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. And that manner of love is manifested in a way much differently than the love of the world is manifested. That we should be called the sons of God. It's in love. And it's through love. And it's by love that Almighty God, before the foundation of the world, indeed, before I believe, the decree went forth to create. He set his eternal love on a people that he chose for himself and gave to his son. He gave to Jesus. He gave them to him as his children and as his bride, as the children of God, as the seed of Christ, and as the bride of Christ. What manner of love did it take to do that? An eternal love. The Father bestowed upon us not something temporary, not something that is of this world. There are some people that have the idea that God created the world, Adam fell, he transgressed there in the garden. And God says, well, I got to do something to make it right. In other words, they believe in a reactive God, a God who must react to what mankind has done. I will submit to you that's no God, that that's something that man has created in his own image. You know, the scripture tells us in the book of Genesis that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He created them, the male and the female. They're in the image of God in the garden. And mankind has twisted that around. And he has made gods in his own image. And he says that this God that has, that he believes, that mankind believes, has revealed himself in this Bible and revealed himself to his children, he believes that he's just kind of like him, only probably a little better since he doesn't have any sin. Since it's God is sinless. But he reacts to what mankind does. I hope that I serve today and I hope that you understand that we believe in a God that is not reactive, but he is active. A God who does not react to what man does because he had already purposed what man should do. Nothing is going to catch him by surprise. 
because his decree, as the hymn writer says, his decree formed the earth, fixed everyone's first birth, and fixed our, if we we're born from above, fixed our second birth as well. That all things that happen upon this earth is, are fixed and sure. And there is nothing that can take place that will surprise our God. This is a God that's worthy of worship. This is the God that is supreme. This is the God who is the one who has revealed himself in the scripture saying, I've declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times the things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. And lest one thinks that's simply an Old Testament doctrine, what did Paul tell us in the New Testament when he said it's God that works in you? both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And upon some, upon these little children, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. Now, one would think at least in trying to use carnal reasoning that God would not set his love upon a bunch of sinful humans because he's a purer eyes than to behold iniquity because he's angry with the wicked every day because he hates sin. But he did, didn't he? In the book of Romans, Paul tells us plainly that he has concluded all under sin. And then he tells us it's none righteous, none that seeketh after God. No, not one. But while we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died not for the godly, but for the ungodly. He sent his love on his children in such a way. Well, in the Gospel of John, it tells us Jesus, having loved his own, love them till the end. Does that just mean the, the 12 disciples, or the 11 I guess, since Judas was a devil from the beginning, is that all it means? No. Does it mean just the ones who were alive at that time? No. Although they had a manifestation of the love of God at that time that was special through the love of Jesus Christ, he had loved his own which was all of them. It was every one of the children. This love, he loved them till the end. The end of what? The end of what appeared to be his natural life. He's going to be betrayed. He's praying in the garden. And Judas comes with the temple guard and betrays him with a kiss. And they take him away and they crucify him. He's still loving his own because that death that he was to die was not because he deserved it. It was not to do anything for himself. Rather, it was to pay the penalty 
for the sin that those whom he loved committed. That's what manner of love God bestowed on us, that he sent his son to die for these children to bring them to where they could not get to themselves by their own strength, by their own abilities, by their own keeping of commandments, and by their own offering of sacrifices. Book of Hebrews tells us, you know, people look at the Jewish law and they say, well, you know, they had all that system of sacrifice, yes, but Paul tells us in Hebrews that couldn't make the ones that came to perform them perfect. You could perform all the sacrifices you wanted, but it wouldn't make you perfect. It would cover that one sin. Then you'd have to repeat it. This love, the love of God, the Father bestowed on us, He sent his son to pour out his blood for his children not because they deserved it but because they couldn't do anything themselves and they didn't deserve it in themselves. Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, said it best. And if my soul were sent to hell, thy righteous law approves it well. To one that feels himself to be a sinner, to one that understands what it means to stand in estrangement from God because of sin, who wants to pray but finds that his words don't get any higher than the ceiling if indeed they go that far, to one who wants to believe but finds his mind shackled to the things of this earth and the things of this world and the system of this world, what can he say? Oh Lord, be merciful me a sinner not to me a good boy not to me a wonderful girl but to me a sinner because that's what he feels in his heart and millions out there would send you to the law that law that couldn't make a comer there too perfect they'd send you there anyway and as the hymn says, what do you find? I cannot satisfy the law, nor hope, nor comfort from it draw, because it condemns you. Where'd that law come from? It came from heaven. It's a law of God. And it's perfect. And it's a standard. And you can't meet it, and neither can I. Indeed, I believe it was given for that reason, to show you. You think you're all right? You think you're good? Measure yourself by this standard. Well, I come up short a couple of times. I'll bet you did. Well, guess what? This is Ten Commandments, but it's also the law. It's a unit. You break number six, guess what? You're a lawbreaker. You break number four, you're a lawbreaker. You can keep all the others perfectly, but you're still a lawbreaker. And there's nothing for you but condemnation because you didn't keep it all, you didn't keep it perfectly. The love of God overwhelms that. It takes that handwriting of ordinances that was against it. It nails it to the cross of Christ. It covers it with his blood. 
so that now that which seemingly was against us can't be found any longer. That which condemned you is put aside and put away. Behold, that's the love of God. Now, somebody says, well, that's all well and good. That's all well and good. That's probably a great theoretical um, description of election, God's choice of a people in Christ before the foundation of the world. And atonement, what Christ did on the cross when he died for his people and reconciled God unto them. And them unto God. But what else? See, brethren, God doesn't deal in just theories. All that's well and good. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us. See, God doesn't doesn't want you to have a perfect theoretical knowledge of all of the systematic doctrines that could be found in the Bible. That's not necessary. That's not necessary. You know what's necessary? That God bestows his love on you. And you are made to see and to feel what you didn't have before. God doesn't leave you ignorant. Let me say that again. God doesn't leave you ignorant that he loves you. He bestows that love on you. And it's like, well, it's like that ointment when Aaron was anointed high priest and the oil was poured on his head and it rolled down his beard even to the hem of his garment. And the love of God, when it's bestowed on you, it's given to you. It is like it is poured out on you and you feel, you feel these things. It's not intellectual. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. See, it'd be one thing just to say, well, God's love made Christ die for a people. But it's got to be applied to you. It has to be applied by the Holy Spirit of God. And it's given to every one of these little children. And they see God no longer as this judge no longer as the one with the law who's going to judge them by it, but rather they see him with the eye of faith as their father who loves them. It's one thing to think, oh, God loves Janie over here. It's another thing to think God loves me. Well, it's obvious God loves Tom. Look what he gave him. No, no, that doesn't mean God loves you. Oh, yes, Tom, he's got a Cadillac. He's got a house with a swimming pool. God's got to love him. No. No, remember what's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. There's a rich man fared sumptuously every day. Give old Lazarus the crumbs that fell from his table. And they both died. A rich man who had all the blessings in this life. In hell lifted up his eyes being in torment. There was no love of God toward him. 
Just the opposite. Just the opposite. God gave him material things. And it's like Jesus said, what happened? If you gained the whole world and lost your soul. He did. And there's old Lazarus. Dogs licking his sores. Getting a crumb every now and then from the table. He's in Abraham's bosom. He's in Abraham's bosom. What manner of love had the Father bestowed on him? that we should be called the sons of God. Now look at the result of this. Therefore, the world knoweth us not. What did Jesus tell his disciples? You're in the world, but you're not of it. You're in the world, but you're not of it. I feel like I'm in it. Well, you may be as far as your body goes, as far as your natural thoughts and your natural mind goes. But the world can know nothing of the spiritual nature that the children of God possess. You see, when the love of God is shed abroad in one's heart, when the Father bestows his love on the children, they're born from above. They experience what the Bible calls a new birth. Now, we were born And the birth manifested a natural being. You look in the mirror, you can see it. Look around, you see all these natural folks. Because the principle was set forth in the book of Genesis when God described his creation. Everything brings forth after its own time. You plant a radish, seed, are you going to get a cucumber? No. You plant corn? Are you going to get barley? No. If there's a new birth, it must bring forth and manifest a new man, a new person, created in righteousness, born of God, called by the Apostle Paul, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the world, who has only a, which only has a natural understanding, knoweth us, knoweth us not. And he tells us why. Because it knew him not. It knew Jesus not. It didn't know Jesus. It didn't know his father. In John's gospel, Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews. And they were, uh, they were kind of, uh, Getting, uh, getting after him, going to stone him, going to do all sorts of things. He says this to him. He says this. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. 
and you do that which you have seen with your father. And they said, answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if Abraham was my father, was your father, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that, I've, that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do your deeds of your father. They said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Notice how it went. Oh, Abraham's our father. Jesus says, Well, if Abraham was your father, you'd do your works of Abraham. Oh, well, God's our father. Now look what he says. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself but he sent me. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Isn't it the truth? The world would rather believe a lie than the truth any time. The lie goes a lot further than the truth. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convince me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. It knew him not. The world didn't know him, though they were in his presence, though they heard his words, he was just the carpenter's son. How'd this man know these things, have it never learned? They didn't see. You know, in one place, you know, somebody come up to him, rich young man come up to him, and said, good master, what good thing must I do so I can inherit eternal life? Rather than answer his question, Jesus looked at him and said, why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that's God. Why do you call me good? In other words, he knew that this man did not realize that he was God, that he was sent from the Father, that he came down from the Father. So he just said, why are you calling me good? None's good but God. Oh, I've been good. I've kept the commandments. Then sell everything you got and give it to the poor and follow me. And he went away sorrowful because he wasn't going to do that. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And if Christ is in you, if there is this new man as well as the old man, Within you, if there is that which is born of the flesh and this which is born of the spirit, and the world doesn't know anything about it because the only thing it knows is outward appearance. Man looks on outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Then he goes on, beloved, now are we the sons of God. This isn't something we're waiting on if we are God's children. If we have been born from above, now we are the sons of God. Because we've always been the sons of God by virtue of his electing love, by virtue of his choice and his giving of a people to Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Well, no, it doesn't, because we've still got these natural bodies. It's all we see with our natural eyes. It doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when Christ shall appear, mark this down in your little book if you've got a little book, the Lord will return. 
Whether it be tomorrow or be a thousand years from now, nobody knows. But he will return and wrap this thing up and say, it's finished. He said his work was finished and he meant it. There was nothing else for him to do. Now he's going to finish everything else. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Him right has said it, when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. And there is coming a day when that will happen. When we shall be like him. When we shall see him as he is. Not as people draw him or paint him, but we'll see the real thing. We'll see the one who died. John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, written in the book of Revelation, didn't it? The revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the future, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he describes him. Not like the people paint him, but describes him as he is. Look at here. Whoop, getting the right book. He says this. In the midst of seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet likened to fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as I were dead. That's a description of Jesus. He's the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, the one that was dead and is alive forevermore. We shall see him as he is. And as we are by this new birth, as we are from this heavenly birth, partakers of the divine nature, we'll be like him. That doesn't mean we're going to have hair white as wool and feet like burnished brass. That means we're going to be as he is. This mortal will put on immortality. What is sown in dishonor will be raised in honor. What's sown natural will be raised spiritual. Oh yes, there's a body prepared. There was a body prepared for Jesus. He said that, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. And thou hast no pleasure in burnt offerings, but the body thou hast prepared me. Our bodies were prepared as well. And they'll be sown. By that means we'll die. When Adam ate of that fruit in the Garden of Eden, he began at that moment to die. And he passed death down to all his posterity, all the way down to you and me. And if this world lasts a year or 5,000 years, every one of them will all die because of sin. Every one of us. But those children of God who have had the love of God bestowed upon them and who understand with the heart 
and believe in the faith of God's elect that Christ has given his life for them, this mortal will put on immortality and will be changed. As the old country hymn said, I'll be changed, changed from this creature that I am. And what'll happen then? That old song said there'll be peace in the valley for me someday. And there will be. Think about this. Even though the love of God has been bestowed on you, you're still in this world and you're still, got, you're still going through suffering. You're still going through misery. You still get sick. All of these things befall the children of God just as much, if not more, than the children of this world. But there's coming a time when all of that will be done away with. And we will experience what the Apostle Paul told us in the book of Romans, that I reckon. Now he's figured it up. If to reckon means to figure up, doesn't it? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. A lot of people want to read that as to us, but it's in us. The glory of God will shine forth from every one of his children. You know, in the description that John gives in Revelation of that new Jerusalem, he said, no need for the sun or the moon, for the glory of God doth lighten the city. And that glory is going to be revealed in every one of the children of God who've been born from above, who have felt themselves to be sinners, and who have had Jesus revealed to them as his, their Savior upon whom the Father hath bestowed this manner of love. Love incomprehensible by the ways of the world. Love incomprehensible even to this natural man. It can only be spiritually understood. If we have not the Spirit of God, we're none of His. Not everybody has this. Those that have been sealed with it, those that have been given it, those who experience it, may not understand everything about it, but they're like that blind man. He said, this is what I know. He said, what, what's been done to you? Jesus had healed him. A man born blind. And the Pharisees, and the rulers of the synagogue came and said, what happened to you? He said, look, I don't know all the details. I've done told you all I can. This is what I know. I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. Because God's love came to him. Jesus came to him and healed his infirmity. Now, let's read this one more time. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, that's the other expression John uses so much in this epistle. Little children and beloved. Because I believe he loved his, these little children. I believe he loved the people whom God loved, who he had been joined to. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
I'm going to close here. I hope that the Lord would bless some of these thoughts to you. Hope it'd be something that you might meditate on and the Lord grant you to feel and understand the measure of his love that he gives to his little children. Bow with me now in this mission. Lord, we know we're not worthy to stand in thy presence. We know we're sinners. We pray that thou would look down upon us, that thy spirit would come to us and show the things of Jesus to us. Reveal him to us as as our Savior and give us peace, give us strength. Lord, as we go through our daily walk, be with us, strengthen our hope that we might be blessed to have fellowship with thee that thou would be our shield and our buckler Heavenly Father all this we ask in the name of Jesus Amen